week two of An American Tale, and in this week we will take a look at the Great Migration which occurred from 1910 to 1940. A major source for the content and images in this PowerPoint came from the Great Migration section of the In Motion, the African American Migration Experience website from the New York Public Library Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture. Let's consider two things that we mentioned last week. That the Great Migration and East European Jewish immigration were part of an international migration pattern. Let's also consider the similar yet unique experiences of African Americans and Jewish Americans as migrants in the United States. And remember our themes of immigration, these major themes which we built our look at Jewish immigration, but now we will take a look at the migration of African Americans from the South to Northern cities. These major themes form the structure of this presentation as well. That way, the comparison will be much easier to make between the two migrations. Let's take a look at a definition of the Great Migration. The Great Migration was the movement of rural Southern Blacks to Northern cities. It was a response to political, economic, and social conditions in the South. The Northward Migrations developed in stages. These migrants were not necessarily farmers. Half of them were migrating from cities and towns in the South. This great migration began the urbanization and nationalization of the African American population. Let's look at stats. Great migration statistics really show this wave of migration that happened at the, at the beginning of the 20th century. During World War I alone, 400,000 African Americans migrated from the South to Northern cities. In total, from the time period 1910 to 1940, 1 1.5 million would migrate. Young men often sent for their families, young men being the pioneers of this migration. From 1910 to 1920, the percentage of African Americans in northern cities rose dramatically by 66% in New York, 148% in Chicago, 500% in Philadelphia, and 611% in Detroit. Like we did with Jewish immigration, let's take at the push look at the push factors of this migration. The political factors of why the migrants left are our first push factors that we'll take a look at. The Jim Crow South. De jure segregation was the form of segregation in the South. These were local laws that mandated segregation, enacted after the Civil War and Reconstruction to keep the races segregated. These laws were deemed constitutional in the famous Plessy versus Ferguson case the Supreme Court heard in 1896, where the separate but equal doctrine was established. Another political factor was that of justice denied. Because of voting restrictions, such as the grandfather clause, literacy tests, poll taxes, refusal by local officials to register blacks to vote. As a result of not being on voter rolls, no blacks served on juries. Their testimony was discounted in court. This resulted in a high rate of convictions for black men accused of crimes. The convict lease system provided prison labor to plantations and corporations like the Tennessee Coal and Iron Company. Prisoners became a virtual slave labor force for railroad construction and coal mining. This heinous practice was expoed in the groundbreaking Pulitzer Prize winning book by Douglas A. Blackman, Slavery by Another Name, The Reenslavement of Black Americans from the Civil War to World War II.
Another push factor was that of terrorism. Without the right to vote and white elected officials offering no protection, African Americans had no legal recourse. They lived in constant terror of mob violence. A rise in terrorism occurred with the resurgence of the Klan in the 1920s. From 1889 to 1932, 3,700 lynchings were reported, 85% of them in the South. Lynching directly impacted migration. Economic changes were also push factors, pushing African American migrants out of southern homelands. The boll weevil infestation started in 1898 in Texas, so spread east. The insects fed on cotton buds, devastating the cotton industry in the United States by the 1920s. When post World War I international markets opened, U.S. growers now face stiff competition from imports. Another push factor was sharecropping. Sharecropping is a type of farming in which families rent small plots of land from a landowner in return for a portion of their share of the crop to be given to the landowner at the end of each year. White Southerners controlled the land, sources of credit, supplies, and the final crop. Black men and women provided the labor. Fraudulent accounting practices were not able to be challenged, which led to debt peonage of sharecroppers. Sharecroppers were forced to pay off the debt with work, forced to work the land until the debt was paid. Make no mistake, debt peonage was virtual slavery, with wages hovering at 75 cents a day. What were some of the pull factors that encouraged, that com gave compelling reason for African Americans to leave the South? What were the factors that pulled them to Northern cities? The most important pull factor was industrial jobs, particularly during World War I. A labor shortage occurred when immigration from Europe dropped dramatically and eventually when millions of American men were shipped off to war. Also, the quota laws of 1921, 1924, and 1929 severely restricted immigrant labor from Southern and Eastern Europe. Millions of jobs became available in America's steel mills, packing houses, and automobile factories. Workers were actively recruited. Labor agents for rail lines like the Erie, Pennsylvania, and Illinois Central, and steel companies, Carnegie and Jones and, and Laughlin, recruited African American workers from the South. By 1920, 17% of all the steel workers in Western Pennsylvania were African American. Southern legislators impeded agents' activities with fees or illegality. The Detroit Urban League worked as an employment broker for the Detroit Employers Association. By 1930, 14% of all auto workers in Detroit were African American. Black newspapers, particularly the Chicago Defender, publicized help-wanted advertisements and advocated for migration. The Defender, distributed by Pullman Porters, here pictured on the right, was confiscated in the South by Southern businessmen and government officials. In the North, African Americans had civil rights. Another pull factor reasons why they came to northern cities. They had voting rights in many states and achieved majorities or pluralities, thereby electing African-American officials. They also formed community organizations and they sought educational opportunities not available in the South for their 
children. Pull factors, political, economic, as well as social. The journey was basically by rail. There were some other forms of transportation, but rail transportation was the transportation of choice for these migrants, but it was expensive. So the young male family member went first and then their family made their ways in stages to their destination. Sometimes it could take years for families to be reunited. The migrants endured, endured segregated waiting rooms and coaches on the Pennsylvania and Illinois Central Railroads. This transportation by rail was so profound, one Illinois Central officer said, we took Negro labor out of the South until it hurt. Pioneers sent letters back home where they were read in church, barber shops, and at the kitchen table. They came home with stories of success, higher wages, and a better racial climate. Family and friends followed these pioneers. This definitive pattern of migration was established. Alabamans to Detroit, Carolinians and Georgians to New York City, Mississippians to Chicago. This is a clear example of chain migration. Black communities formed based on these patterns of migration and were established in northern and western cities. In New York, it was Harlem, the south side of Chicago, Pittsburgh's Hill District, the Black Bottom of Detroit, and the neighborhood of 18th Street and Vine in Kansas City. Prior to World War I, Harlem was already the largest colony of colored people in similar limits in the world. Located north of Central Park, centered between 130th and 145th streets, the African American population in Harlem grew over 400% between 1910 and 1930, from 50,000 to 200,000. It was home to many African-American social and political organizations, a center of racial pride and solidarity, which gave rise to unprecedented creativity in literature and the arts. Harlem was an African-American cultural capital, but the site of the Harlem Renaissance and the Jazz Age is often a romanticized version of Harlem. The color line circumscribed and limited life for African Americans in Harlem. As Langston Hughes reflected, nor did ordinary Negroes like the growing influx of whites towards Harlem after sundown, flooding the little cabarets and bars where formerly only colored people laughed and sang, and where now the strangers were given the best ringside tables to sit and stare at the Negro customers like amusing animals in a zoo. Professor Catherine Rottenberg deemed Harlem a double-edged legacy. Its residents had a very complex relation with the community. Harlem represented promise, possibility, and hope, as well as despair. African American migrants were repulsed by and attracted to Harlem. While leaders such as W.B. Du Bois, James Weldon Johnson, Nella Larson, Jesse Fawcett, Marcus Garvey called Harlem home, it was also an overcrowded, poverty-ridden, racialized, urban enclave. Was it the New Canaan? Harlem's death rate was 42% higher than the rest of the city. The infant mortality rate, twice that of the white population. The tuberculosis rate, four times that of whites. And unemployment ran at 50%. Lingering unemployment and persistent police brutality caused the Harlem riot of 1935. Tensions were so high, the arrest and mis rumored mistreatment of a young black Puerto Rican shoplifter set off an evening of looting and rioting. Three African Americans were killed, 60 wounded, 75 people, mostly black, were arrested. 
The riot caused over $200 million in damages and ended the Harlem Renaissance. Segregation and discrimination existed in northern cities. It just took a different form. De facto segregation happened as a matter of fact. The fact was the concentration of African Americans in certain neighborhoods. Housing discrimination in the North didn't happen by law, but by practices that kept African Americans segregated in certain neighborhoods. The fact is that practices such as restrictive covenants, redlining, legal deals, the refusal to sell to blacks, the use of intimidations, and the threat of violence and use of force severely limited the freedom of African Americans to live where they chose. With the housing market closed to blacks, landlords divided properties into smaller units and charged exorbitantly high rents, creating serious overcrowding and unsanitary conditions. The infant mortality rate was twice that of whites. And neighborhood schools ensured the segregation of public education. Job discrimination was prevalent too. African Americans worked in menial jobs for low pay with no chance for advancement. Housing segregation limited physical and social mobility. In St. Louis, the fear of blacks used as strike breakers led to violence in July of 1917. With no police or National Guard protection, 40 to 150 African American residents of East St. Louis were killed and 6,000 fled the city. The NAACP sponsored the Silent March, pictured here in New York City. 10,000 marched to protest the lack of government protection and the suppression of dissent. High summer temperatures, segregated beaches, and the arrest of a black man led to the eruption of the south side of Chicago in the summer of 1919, nicknamed the Red Summer. 38 were killed, 23 of them black, 537 wounded. Over a thousand people were homeless. Most of the families were black. The arrest of a 19-year-old young man for assaulting a white woman led African Americans to rally and help the sheriff protect the young man. The quote-unquote Negro Wall Street of America was left unguarded. 1,000 black businesses and homes were destroyed. 75 to 300 African Americans were killed. Half the black population left Tulsa.